Well, uh, welcome back, um, those people who've had a stretch and, and then gone outside and, you know, just had a little breath of air in between. Um, but we're having a, a, a session now which follows so on so well um, from the previous session that we've had uh, on music in detention uh, as a theme. So it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome Professor Georgi Ravulo, who is Professor of and Chair of Social Work and Policy Studies at the University of Sydney. Um, his research areas of interest include health and wellbeing, youth, decoloniality, and educational leadership. He's been involved in authoring over 70 publications from journal articles through to opinion pieces. So you will find his work in a lot of places. Uh, this afternoon, he will be presenting um, on understanding the lived experience of young people in contact with the criminal justice system through music. Georgie, um, we welcome you. I want to be where the people are. I want to see, want to see them dancing, walking around on those, what do you call them? Oh, feet. Up where they run, up where they walk, up where they stay all day in the sun, wandering free. Wish I could be part of that world. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. <laughs> My name is Tochi Ravulo, and as already announced, I will be talking about the lived experience of young people involved in the criminal justice system and their lived experience, understanding how we should be privileging that whilst also understanding how we can meaningfully include such perspectives so that we can create opportunities, outputs, outcomes, environments, systems, structures and services that genuinely create such lived experience to be part of that world. Uh, hence why I sang the song in the beginning, get it, part of that world, from The Little Mermaid, right? And it's this idea that a lot of the time when we are in respective space and place, especially with the criminal justice system, there is, there is an onus that we continuously place on the individual to be better. But for me, it's about understanding how we can genuinely incorporate and include such lived experience to really shake up our social structures, systems and services so that we are creating more inclusive ways, uh, more opportunities to ensure that such realities are understood in helpful ways. Uh, before I continue on, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands, the uh, terrible uh, nation, and uh, pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. I work on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation back in Sydney. Uh, to also acknowledge that the lands in which we are gathered um, especially here in Australia, they're still considered stolen as sovereignty was never ceded. And to further reiterate an ongoing commitment to work collaboratively with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, um, as part of my role as Chair of, of Social Work and Policy Studies at the University of Sydney, I strive to ensure that all of our units of study are meaningfully inclusive of Indigenous ways of knowing and doing and being and becoming, not just tokenistically listed in one area. And I think it's really, really important that we continue to collaborate in ways that is meaningful, not just tokenist, tokenistic in the way in which we actually, again, centre Indigenous perspectives. I'm from an Indigenous Pacific heritage. My father's Indigenous Fijian. So a lot, of, um, a lot of the things that I know from my own personal experience around Indigenous perspectives can be meaningfully incorporated, incorporated in, in Western structures, but at the same time, shaking up such Western structures to be meaningfully uh, inclusive, but even reformed and shaped around Indigenous epistemologies and ontologies. So a quick reflection question. 
I want to ask yourselves and get yourselves to just quickly talk amongst yourselves for uh, 30 seconds. What would you say to your younger self? Now, I want you to think about when you were a young person, what would be something as an adult that you are now, I'm assuming most of, all, uh, uh, of us are adults in the room, what would you say to your younger self based on now where you are at, based on where you've lived life, based on you know, coming through the other side of adolescence? What would you say to your younger self. Turn to your neighbour or your neighbours and quickly share with them what you would say to your younger self. Go for it. Alrighty. I'm going to quickly ask for people to share where they feel comfortable, where appropriate, of course. What would you say to your younger self? Any volunteers from here? What would you say to your younger self? I would say don't sweat the small stuff and don't worry about your grades and just, you know, follow your path. Great. Thank you. Down the front here, what would you say to your younger self, Bridie? That all of those adverse and challenging childhood experiences are actually going to help you to develop your greatest strengths in understanding the world and people and relating in empathetic ways. Interesting. Oh, I like that. Thank you. Um, up over here, what would you say to your younger self? <laughs> Two things. Eat less sugar sooner. And the other thing is, don't be a people pleaser. Oh, interesting. Thank you so much. Now, it's interesting in the context of um, having uh, um, hindsight and being able to think through the way in which we've now understood or we now create our own narratives based on where we've come from. One of the key things that I found, especially when working with young people, is the need to ensure that we provide them with a space to explore. One of the key things that we know from life's life course development or the context of understanding people as I, people's identity is that it varies. And, and, and having that context is key. So even though we might have hindsight as adults about what we've done as young people, as Bridie actually said, a lot of those particular experiences are part of that particular journey in and of itself. And one of the key things that we need to continue to be mindful of, especially when we're working with young people in criminal justice systems and settings, is that they are on a journey. And I'll start with this particular uh, context of understanding the lived experience through music. So I found that for me in working with young people, there are three key areas. that it, that It's intersectional, it's contextual, and it's relational. These three key areas provide scope for us to really privilege the way in which we position young people in the context of their contexts. So intersexual is really understanding the young person and their intersecting areas of diversity and all the way in which our identities are intersectional. It's really, really important that we understand that in the broader context of our engagement, that it is contextual that there are uh, contexts in which uh, young people are located, um, especially understanding community and, and the respective cultures in which they might be located within those communities. And relational. It's really, really important that we don't forget that relationships is key. And for a lot of young people that I've worked alongside, it is about being able to understand me and we. This idea of we are part of something more than just myself. And a lot of young people, especially if they've come from collectivist cultures, already by default position themselves in the we. 
And it's a matter of then understanding how the me also plays out in the we. Okay, so I'm now going to unpack and provide some specific examples about those three areas as part of, again, that shared approach that we should be developing in the context of privileging lived experience of young people involved in the criminal justice system or in contact with the criminal justice system. I'm going to start with this first area around intersectional and understanding young people. And what I've done is... I have um, given examples for each area of publications, key publications that I've been involved in uh, over the years that provide further context. So these publications are available um, online. You can access them. The first one is a book chapter that was published earlier this year in a book called Working with Families Experiencing Vulnerability. And the chapter that I wrote was on understanding young people. The chapter was, it was put in the context of this idea of journeying. And this idea of journeying with self and with, fa with others and then broader society. So again, this idea of, of, of more of a holistic view of adolescent development and the way in which that should be privileged in the context, again, of systems and structures and services that are being developed, especially in the legal context. One of the key things that I highlight in this particular chapter, again, is this notion of intersectionality, that we are all not just one areas of identity. And Western and white contexts and systems really do think through the binary. You're either this or that. You're only one area of diversity. We don't think more broadly of our intersecting areas of identity. And we fail then to understand the richness and the nuance that occurs in the context of young people and their developmental journey. So the key things that I talk about in this chapter is about uh, understanding a young person and their identity and their journey with their socioeconomic status, with their gender expression, with their sexuality, with their religion or spirituality with their ability, and I'm talking about areas of ability like uh, their physical ability, their, their mental ability, the, the context in which they are able or, or the way in which they're understood in the context of ability. Their indigeneity, their language, their citizenship status, that also plays a big difference in the way in which they're understood and nav navigate their identities. Uh, the locality, so whether it's rural or regional, or whether it's a built-up environment with the infrastructure in which they're located, and also their ethnicity. And it's really interesting because one of the key things that I always am challenged by is this idea of culture. I think in Australia, in the, in the language, in the Australian context, whenever we say the word culture, the first thing that we generally think of is when we hear the word culture. Shout it out. What do we normally think of? Ethnicity. Yeah. Race. That's just the thing that we talk about when we think about culture, but culture is all of that and then more. So it's really, really important that one of the key things that we're trying to do, and I, the work that I've been doing is, again, being able to understand the intersectional context in which young people are located and the way in which those particular areas and attributes are understood. Now, I'm going to show you a quick example of a music project that I ran 20 years ago. It's its 20th anniversary, right, when I first became a social worker. And I've been very passionate about using music uh, as a form of practice, both personally and professionally. And this music project was called Ed's Music Project, and it was specifically put together to work alongside young people involved in the criminal justice system, so young offenders, young people involved in crime. And the music project was designed to use music as a vehicle, especially when it came to understanding, and at the time, to be honest with you, 20 years ago, I wasn't aware of the language of intersectionality. But 20 years later, I now look back at this particular film clip that we're about to watch. And as we watch this particular film clip of diverse young people, I want you to be in, um, um, keep in mind these areas that we've just looked at, okay? Because I'm going to come back and do a pop quiz to see which areas you saw. Here we go. So I'm going to play this clip. We've got time to do so. So here we go. This is some of the young people that were involved in the project.
lift me up from my feet You got me going to places I've never been I've never seen I'm looking around for the one in town You came to me, you drive me low, you fly me high Living a dream, could this be a fantasy to ever need And not mislead this beautiful treat From a birth, sent to love, all is done All for you, somehow I can't let go now Give it up. <laughs> so what are some of the intersecting areas of identity that we saw from that clip, that uh, visual representation from that song and the lyrics? What were some of those particular things? Let me put back on those areas. Yeah, did you know? <laughs> so you were like, yeah. Yep, so location, thank you. Great. Yes. Great. Thank you. Place. Yes. Yeah, nice. Yes, yeah, so ethnicity. Ah, interesting. Yes, thank you. The use of music. What else did we see? Citizenship. Yes. And this, this, this level of belonging. Or this this idea of belonging. Yep. Nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 It is fascinating, and that's interesting because um, a lot of those young people they wanted to be involved in the film clip and they wanted to do that, but they were a bit unsure about their visual representation, not because they didn't want to be involved, but it was this sense of, do I belong? Am I part of something? And so when they saw the actual film clip, and it's now been uploaded many years ago and had lots of views, they continue to celebrate what that represents for who they are and what they've put out in the world, irrespective of how they might be perceived. Any other areas of identity that you can see come through with that. Yes, definitely. So sexuality and even gender expression, even gender norms, gender values. Yes. And even the way in which, so this was 20 years ago and we had female young people rapping and talking about who they are and it's like, oh, we don't sort of, we didn't expect that, like in the sense of, so even the way in which we understand gender norms and values. So once again, these particular areas of music can again create scope for us to understand the intersecting context in which our young people are located and how these particular perspectives need to permeate our six systems, our structures, uh, our services. The second thing I want to talk about next, and I'll skip to the next one, is the, con the context. So understanding community. 
So now I'm going to go to an example of One Four, which is a music group from Western Sydney. And I want to talk about how context is key. And so I was involved in a publication that was published uh, early this year again, or late last year. And it was called uh, Drilling in the Name of the Criminalization of Sydney Drill um, Group 1-4. That was with Professor Murray Lee, Dr. Tobin Martin and myself, and the manager of 1-4. Uh, 1-4 is a, a music group from Western Sydney. Uh, Sarah had mentioned the documentary that's on Netflix at the moment, so you can check that out. Uh, and we've just actually received an ARC Discovery Project grant with Alexis. Give us a wave, Alexis. Uh, to look at the over-policing of Australian popular music in Australia, which is based on this work, right? So the reason why I'm putting this up as a case study is because context is key in understanding the community. And I'm just going to quickly read this quote from this particular paper to further highlight the way in which music is part of a shared conversation to disrupt the context in which people may be understood and located. So Pacific uh, values are also in play when creating modern music. There is an intentional connection to the way in which music is developed and performed by Pacific people. It is not about a random act of creating a beat based on new ideas, but rather one that also draws upon previous music characteristics and qualities known and understood within Pacific cultures and practices. Similar to other communities, there is an evolving nature of the role of music amongst Pacific communities and the role contemporary music approaches can have in development, both socially and economically. At the same time, it still provides a space to meaningfully integrate Pacific Indigenous values and viewpoints within the forms of contemporary expression. The desire to share lived experience of Pacific realities in Western Sydney through drill is a reflection of the shared struggle Pacific people may experience. It provides a tangible and shared voice within the Australian music industry traditionally known to be void of diversity. By virtue of being Pacific, this disrupts the socio-political landscape that is traditionally white and Western Western, middle class and educated. By having Pacific people occupy such music spaces, it challenges the status quo that is generally characterised by the overrepresentation across criminal and legal systems due to offending behaviour, their higher prevalence of non-communicable diseases such as diabetes in the health systems, their lower rates of engagement in further education and training and their representation in low-skilled labour. As Tongan Western Sydney writer Winnie Dunn has commented, to see one four come to prominence by telling their own stories and really getting the nuances of what it means to grow up as a Pacific Islander in Mount Druitt has been a powerful thing. Telling a personal, specific story in music empowers communities and creates discursive space for cultural and political change to occur. So what I'm going to do now is, I do have time, I'm going to quickly play uh, one four's first music track, okay? And I want you to keep in mind again what was just mentioned here in this idea of context and the way in which discur uh, um, discourse sorry, is understood in the broader uh, conversation um, around young people and their representation. Here we go. It's called The Message. <laughs> if you do not wish to receive this call, please hang up now with call the witch making from the correctional complex. With Telly 1-4 from the Western Sydney, I've been remind on that lockdown. Free Freddy, free Levy, free me, free Vondo, free Justin, free Jeff, free the 70, free the 1-4. JM, I'm a 1-4 veteran Boss on my hood cause I back my section When I met the streets and slapped that thing Lad, I knew I felt my obsession Had me running the ball, no question Swear any op I saw, I pressed him Either sell YP or Lex Couldn't leave his chest without no injection 1-4, we've been putting in work Since knee high, them days on the curb Now I'm proud to say to this day forward That the 7 put it up on a shirt Just fill up the car and urge Got things on hips, watch ops disperse I back my shank and you pull yours And see who will take off first d d d Don't whinge and cry like me so Mako grip and right Have your team all wet and wild Right where my crew bring clips and slide Wanna talk them clips and try This is a different side You boys just bitch and hide Come out and ride for your friend Cause someone got dipped and shh Someone got dipped and shh mm. 
Get down when I grip that steel Hands up when I bring that hammer Come through while I pull that ching Have your head face down like a Southwest ganger 1-4, we ain't got no manners Only if you test my crew If you ain't a part of this beef And you wanna talk shit, you can get some too See me eating well Pull down my chin for my show and tell Call me Festus when you hear the bell I'll be wrecking ops like I'm wrecking Ralph We on the block so there ain't no fouls I'll be scoring points when I kick him out I'm on the road and it's getting loud When you see me approach like another route I'm on the high from the ganja My sticky can put you down under These ops are broke and I feel the ache That I toss to go half on a bumper The cocker got me feeling jumpy Roll the dice and got stuck in Jumanji Getting triple digits like I'm Scotty Pippen We've been in the kitchen, got it Ramsey Ooh, now that I'm down for the 2 7 no. Die for my set, you already know Knocking them down like the dominoes I know that they know that Spenny's about to blow All of my dubs coming in the road But I'm still writing raps on my rack and phone Retaliation is a must, ain't no maybe, ifs or buts nah. We took numerous trips around there, but lad, that's something I can't discuss no way. I don't wanna end up in cuffs uh. We heartless, wrong or right, regardless, yeah, I'ma back my blood Shh, got got and he left his eyes on shit and he's still out talking tough huh. They don't know about taking risks, them big lads, they ain't made for this We invest in shanks and shivs and if there's beef, we taking trips I can't call them ops, like we beefing flops I got friends looking at ten, you watch George get put in a box Put in a box Who wants smoke? Don't want smoke, trust me, mothers, them boys ain't ready. 21 what? But one got knocked. Ha, I guess that makes them 20. Free up Freddy and Lebs. Plus my co is Deacon Chef. Making moves what them boys follow. Playing these games like Simon says. They call me Chingy not, cause the way that I squint my eyes. When things get iffy, then I'm known to wave and just swing my knife. When it goes in them, then I push the blade a few, few more times. 2 7 drill them, them boys fit them, stay them right, just bitching life. We twist up while them boys just dancing. Strictly shivin', shanking, push. That sword like captain step on deck and flank him too much for But no action, they came for women. I'm not here romancing. No I'll use anything just to get the win. I don't take no chances. Aye. Don't step on the field, cause weapons are still are used to play this step game. Step. Don't believe in your home, cause setting a stone is where you'll see your name. <sighs> if I lack when I'm out, then I stomp till I see his brains. Leave these pavement stains, I'll do it again and again. Do it again and again. <laughs> That's reckless shivers. If it's done by me, so be the YP, then lad, there ain't no difference. No pull out for decoration, this thing goes all in him. That's vicious drillers, opposite victims out on a mission, souls are missing. I love just fucking twisting. Okay, thank you. You are. What are we thinking about this notion of context and the way in which we're understanding, again, young people involved? in structures, systems, structures, services, young people involved in the criminal justice space. What are we thinking? People are like, oh my gosh, clutch pearls. <laughs> <gasps> but based on this idea of contextual understanding community, what are we getting from the music? What are we getting from the lyrics? Okay. A shared struggle, shared experience. Thank you. Of resistance. Who said that? Resistance. Yes. Now, why is resistance important? Yes. 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 So just for the recording and also for the audio, we're just talking about the many ways in which such communities may be over-policed and over-scrutinised and, and there's levels of oppression, right? So this is part of what we're also trying to do when it comes to music and the way in which music can be mobilised to shake it up. And one of the key things that we do see, and yes, check out the Netflix doco, but there is a, a level of tension that we need to be sitting within. And yes, you don't have to necessarily agree, I get it. Like it's sometimes people will say to me, but aren't you supporting the violence associated with such lyrics and visual imagery? And it's like, well, no, it's about understanding where such young people are located, where they come from. A lot of the stuff may be expressive of their lived experience, but more so again, that, that notion of these are the systems, the structures and services that they are located within. And what are we actually doing about it, people? Like, what are we doing about it? So that's what's also key in the context of this particular example as well.
Now, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to quickly go to my third and final example, which is about understanding the relational and how relational or the relationships that we form with young people is so, so key. Um, there's this piece that's about to be published next month um, uh, in a new uh, book called Youth Crime, Youth Justice and Children's Court in New South Wales. I wrote this chapter called Deconstructing, Decolonising, Disrupting Youth Justice Approaches with Pacific Young People. Now, the editor, uh, the actual book, uh, the, the company actually changed it to Pacific Young People, but I was like, no, 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 it's with. Not, we're not doing things over and on. That's the point of why we're struggling in this context. So I asked them to change it back to with Pacific Young People. There's some key points that I put up, and I'm just going to quickly read those two key points, and then I'm going to give you an example of a program that's being ran by New South Wales Youth Justice at the moment, and the importance that that program is trying to achieve in shaking up the way in which the system is located, especially carceral spaces. So culturally nuanced and informed models of intervention can provide a reduction in stress and strain, leading to aggression and violence. This was evident in a study conducted by Leanne Prolo, uh, Pro, uh, with in, in, incarcerated ethnic native Hawaiian Pacific Islander youth in Hawaii. A mindfulness-based curriculum incorporating traditional spiritual practice shared by Hawaiian Pacific Islander elders was utilised. This involved 10 modules uh, presented as two one-hour sessions over a five-week period and covered introductions to mindfulness, mindful breathing, mindful listening, mindful of the body, mindful of thought, mindful of emotion, balance and choice. As a result, young people were able to better self-regulate and manage their emotions while navigating and creating an understanding on the context in which such feelings and behaviours occurred. Now that looks at this notion of culture and, and uh, positionality and the way in which we can help people understand their uh, struggles. But one of the key things, and I'm conscious of how we also use that as a way of disrupting spaces, is the next quote in regards to the systems theory. So from a systems theory perspective, social structures should be created to proactively respond to the needs of the people within. The lack of ability for people to access support within these systems is a reflection of inaccessible or unresponsive services within the systems. This includes the legal education, the legal education health and welfare systems and the accompanying service models that are created within to respond to each such needs in the community. If we apply a systems theory approach to youth offending, we can create a collective understanding of the need to reform structures that deter inclusion. We would provide a platform for services to be supported by a local community that embraced its individuals as part of the collective. So one of the things that I'm trying to uh, achieve through something like this particular chapter and the work that I continue to do in community is to really, again, shake up the way in which we understand the individual within the broader context of society knowing that we are all part of the shared conversation, that we are all part of the solution. Too often do we relegate responsibility to the individual involved in the justice system as opposed to, well, no, their, their incarceration, their engagement in such spaces is a broader reflection on us as a society. So an example of a program that's running at the moment in Youth Justice New South Wales is a similar sort of program called Pacifica, and this is where they're trying to support Pacific young people to feel seen and made visible in the context of their carceral space. Yes, I'm still challenged by the ideas that such carceral spaces exist, but we've found, I did the uh, evaluation or the review for this program that's been running in, in, our, um, in one particular centre in New South Wales. I did this review a couple of months ago. I was commissioned by New South Wales Youth Justice to do this. And here are some of the quotes from the young people up on the screen about what this program actually meant and did for them. One of the key things that we got from this particular involvement in the program was their, their ability to feel seen and heard and understood in the bigger picture of the system itself. But also what we found from the actual program itself was that it, as a result of running this program in a relationally driven way with all staff, and, and it wasn't just actually, this program wasn't just designed for Pacific young people, it was actually designed for all young people. So we had a lot of young people that were from African and Middle Eastern backgrounds and First Nations Australians that were also involved in this program. And we found that from this particular program itself, it provided a sense of connection to self and others. The staff in, the actual, uh, in these carceral spaces also developed a level of rapport and connection that provided a sense of community within those respective spaces, which youth justice doesn't necessarily want per se, but that's what these particular relational approaches were striving to do. 
And it wasn't about appeasing their time inside. It was about actually unlocking the understanding of who they were and, again, their lived experience and how that could be utilised to transform their, their journey and uh, how also the system is being held account to the way in which they understand the locality of such young people. So, in summary... Our understanding of the lived experience through music is intersectional. I believe that it does provide scope for us to understand the intersecting needs of young people. It is contextual, that we do need to understand the communities in which such young people are located and how we're part of that. And it is relational. We do need to understand the me and we and how we are all part of a bigger conversation to ensure that we're all part of that world. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Georgie, for a wonderful summation of uh, the um, contextual areas that are so important in understanding the, um, the ideas of youth in detention, of, of music with youth in detention, and the kinds of um, effects that that, that can have. Uh, the kinds of understandings that it can bring to us um, it, uh, as we watch what happens, participate in what happens. Uh, I'd like to invite Alexis Callio, who's been very busy this afternoon, <laughs> to uh, respond to your um, keynote, Georgie. My dear sweet child, that's what I do. It's what I live for, to help unfortunate merfolk like yourself. Poor souls with no one else to turn to. <laughs> and therein lies the danger, right? So I think that one thing that has reminded me from the past session and then you've made acutely clear is that danger of coming in as the musical Ursula to save poor unfortunate souls. You reminded me of some work that Cathy and I have done um, together on the politics of diversity and the role of, that music plays in... Um, helping us to recognize difference, um, but also categorize it. Um, and the way that we recognize people that we're in relation with, but also categorize them. Um, and the power of music to both determine, but also disrupt those locations um, of how we see people and how we come into relation, but also where we put ourselves. Um, and I think what you reminded me, which I, probably need reminding of more often than I'd like to admit, is that this is always changing, especially for young people, but for everybody. Who we are is not fixed. It's not um, something that we, we... We don't orient ourselves in relation to a fixed other. We're both always um, becoming in relation. Um, and that's especially visible, perhaps, for adolescents. Um, so thank you for that reminder. Um, and that potential for music to create that discursive space for political change, I was reminded of a um, question slash response slash discussion we had yesterday um, with Tom's um, urge for us to perhaps settle down on the outreach and think about some inreach. I didn't think that I'd see one for in the Ian Hanger Recital Hall. <laughs> Um, and I hope we might see a little bit more drill in the next three years as we embark upon this process. But I think that, you know, even small disruptions, disrupting what gets shown in a conservatorium recital hall, disrupting ideas of who we are and who each other are and who adolescents are and should be, um, I think is inherent in music. Music is inherently political. Um, and that's, I think, why we're all here. That's what makes it so interesting and fun and complex and messy and so innately human or mer people. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so I'd like to leave the time mainly for discussion, but I just wanted to thank you for the, um, such powerful reminders um, and for all of your good work. Um, and I'm looking forward to learning alongside you in the next few years. Thank you. Well, I'd like to invite questions um, from the audience. Uh, and also, uh, Lucas, um, are you there? Can you tell us whether there are some online questions? No questions for the moment. OK, right. So anybody from the audience like to ask a question about the many things that have been unveiled in that um, talk? <laughs> Alexis. <laughs> um, this might be a really elementary question, but it's something I keep coming back to. Why music? Why not sport? Why not dance? Why not? And I mean, it's not always so easily separable. Um, but why do you think music is an interesting space to play with this work or to, to do things through and with? Um, why not painting or any of the other possible things that young people enjoy doing and we enjoy doing with them? I think because music is also quite intersectional in its own right, and I think that's what happens a lot of the time. If you look at youth culture and youth subcultures, a lot of the time the way in which young people may identify with a particular community group or a subculture, it may revolve around music. Um, so I think that's where a lot of the uptake of music and the way in which music is utilised by young people. Not all young people want to be, you know, singing or performing an instrument. They want to still be involved. And there's different ways in which young people can be involved, like, you know, the filming element or the audio uh, and the, you know, all the stuff, the production element of music. But I think one of the reasons why music is so appealing is because, again, the way in which it permeates the subcultures of adolescence and adolescent development. Yes, Tom. Yeah, uh, first a, a comment on the ads mention. I just keep thinking about the location of the high school and the detention centre being... Next door to each other. Yeah. Oh, opposite. So Ayrs opposite High School is opposite, the road. and then Briar Road Primary School is next door to the Youth Justice Centre. So Ayrs is in um, southwest Sydney, of Greater Western Sydney. I should have set that up, sorry. And it's already uh, it's being developed as we speak, but it is predominantly public housing. So that, that location, similar to Minto, it was redeveloped, but similar, a lot of those suburbs in the Campbelltown local government area in southwest Sydney of Australia has been predominantly public housing and has been over scrutinised and over policed. And wondering why that, that actually happens in the first place, um, as, a, as a, just a general comment. I think we can all work, think through that. But then playing the message, um, yes. Winnie Dunn talks about um, that people of colour can make art however the hell they want to make art and for whom they want to make art, they should be able to do whatever they want. And the fact of it, that video starts with that disclaimer. Um, so at, a, at an immediate point, it's saying it's an expression of art. Yes. Um, but what is it about music that is a little bit different to other art forms that gives that response? Um, that scares people. I keep thinking about as a former school teacher, mm. a music teacher educator, that mm. um, other art forms seem okay to drop in a swear word or study a text that has a suicide reference, mm. but potentially having a song in an exam which had a swear word would just never happen in music mm. um, in a senior school sense, let alone a little bit younger where they might be exposed to that. Um, so thoughts on that? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. One is definitely music is visceral in the sense of there's a sense of connection that people will have with music, the lyrics, the visuals. I think what we're seeing there then also is it's black and brown bodies that continue to disrupt the Australian landscape. They're 
One Four is now mo one of the most popular drill groups in the world, and it, it's counterintuitive to the Australian narrative as to what music is in Australia. So I think that's why it is disruptive and it creates tension for a lot of people outside of the genre. Then the other key thing uh, with what we're seeing is we, we know we know from research that music people consume music and genres of music based on where they're feeling emotionally and where they might be at. But it doesn't actually create that sense of I'm now going to go out there and commit and, and, and stab people. Um, or even if people are listening to music that's, you know, um, related to mental health or depression, it's not necessarily that they are going to enact those particular areas of well-being. It's just it, it relates to their mood, it relates to where they're at, their lived experience. And that's what we see also with One Four and their popularity. Is a lot of the time young people are relating to the context in which they are located. Again, that community context. The last thing to note is that we know, and we wrote a conversation piece on this as well that's out there, we know that drill music doesn't cause crime. There's no evidence, no evidence to suggest that at all. So it's moral panic. Again, it's the clutching of the pearl stuff. And I think that needs to be caught out. Exactly. So the way in which music can disrupt the status quo um, and I think that's what I love about the challenges of music is that it does create scope for such conversations to be had, but it needs to be done in ways that continues to critique and prod and provoke. Um, and I think we can all be part of that. Y yes. Uh, <laughs> question up there. Spark, yeah. more questions. <laughs> Perhaps the driest question of the day. What of Anaka? Um, I, I, um, I was thrilled because this, these past few days we've been seeing a lot of things that are, I think, probably based in Western medical models. And I loved that I saw Fonofale up, up there and that the student understood or the, 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 the research design was around that and that was the way of measuring, I guess, um, success for that group. It's so important. Can you talk a little bit about that um, within that? Uh, project? That last example? Yeah, yeah. In the yeah. Fonofale model yeah. and the things like that? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So one of the key things that we also need to do when it comes to young people in areas of diversity um, is to ensure that we are utilising models. So that Fonofale model is an example of Pacific Indigenous perspectives and the way in which we position our health. Traditionally, the Fonofale model was this idea of health, but looking at how um, our well-being is holistically driven by default of our collectivist contexts. So by default, we are located within the we, and our identities are always embedded within that particular idea. So if you come at us with a, a, a Western medical model that generally pathologizes and individualizes care, it ain't gonna work. Similar with First Nations communities in Australia, it's not going to work. But we continue to go, those people are not engaging with us. Their help-seeking behaviour needs to be improved, their health literacies and their resiliencies, and it's like... <laughs> I want to swear as well, but I won't. I remain <laughs> professional. But that's the point, right, is that we need to be disruptive, we need to deconstruct, we need to decolonise, we need to ensure that we are, um, again, we're all part of that conversation. We're not just saying, you people get on with it and then come back to us when you're ready. No, we all need to be part of that shared conversation. Uh, Bridie, you had a question? Uh, thank you. That was fantastic. Personal comment, but I yeah, thank really you. benefited from that. I'm just wondering. Um, I'll see how this question comes out. When it comes to the pearl clutching, yes, is there still an element of that? I'm not going to call it fear. I'm thinking of it as vulnerability. In your work, working with these cohorts, groups, young people, is there still an element of of that shade of vulnerability for you? Mm. So I'm not going to lie, when I watch even the film clip like One Four, I, yeah. get, a, I get quite emotional. Uh -huh. yeah. The reason being is that there's a cultural load, right, associated with watching such positionalities play out. Yeah, it's, 
I'll say it, it's fucked. It's, it's not helpful. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, you can censor me. Clear, um, yeah. And, it's, it's, and, and for me, they're our brothers and sisters, uh, our young people, they're our broader community, they're part of our, you know, our identity. Um, you know, and for us to see this play out, even the over-policing, um, a lot of my work also is on um, other areas of inclusion. I'm doing a lot of stuff around gender diversity and, and sexuality, again, that intersecting stuff. So I'm always attuned to this idea of marginality and how we're continuously marginalised a lot of times uh, because of the dominant discourses. Uh, especially white and Western discourses that permeate all areas. And a lot of my work now is on critical whiteness. There's a handbook that's coming out soon that I, I've overseen over the last couple of years called the uh, Handbook of Critical Whiteness, Deconstructing Dominant Discourses Across Disciplines. Do you love, I love alliteration. You can tell I love alliteration. <laughs> and in that, in that is this idea, and when I talk about critical whiteness, a lot of people go, oh, you can't talk about whiteness because you're talking about us as white people and blah, blah, and it's not, it's like, no, whiteness actually negatively impacts everybody, even yeah. white people, right? And again, it's this idea going to the response of the question. My thing is we all need to, and you've heard me say this many times in my responses, we all need to be part of a shared conversation because otherwise you continue to perpetuate an, a level of isolation and marginality as a result of not actually taking responsibility and ownership for the things that you're seeing up on the screen. And there's a vulnerability in the we-edness of it. I, exactly, and yeah. I think that's why whiteness is a sore point for people, because yeah. they get, oh, you can't talk about that, but you have to. people are racialized all the time, people are categorized all the time, people are made to feel different all the time. And it goes again back to discourse and language. Um, my quick point, I've got an opinion piece coming out in the Canberra Times in a couple of days, and it's called Whiteness Has Won Again, Politics yeah. Playing Fear of the Foreigner. And we saw that with the detention, the immigration, the stuff that happened recently, and the discourse and language that we get from the opposition leader, and it's like you continue to perpetuate in us and them, especially of foreigners and migrants, and it's just not helpful. So when the Canberra Times said it will publish it, I was like, great, because hopefully the politicians will read this piece. But it's going back to the same point around we all need to be part of a shared conversation. Thank you. exercise um, not so much a question but I'm just want to say I'm here for this I'm just like clicking um, just listening to the lyrics um, when one horse say free levy at the start or a, a whole yes. bunch of uh, young people that they listed it was just interesting when you're saying about context that levy is a young South Sydney's um, person in Nam Melbourne um, who is also a part of a drill like slash hip-hop uh, crew and I was working at a youth centre at YSAS in Dandenong as the message was uh, released. And it was interesting just to see the number of views go from like a couple of hundred thousand right up to millions of mm. uh, views. And I felt like our youth centre was actually contributing to that. Like every young person who were involved in carceral logics were yeah. um, coming through the youth centre. Yeah. And um, the association laws um, started increasing um, in terms of hip hop artists who were being um, viewed um, through these lyrics yes. and um, so those laws then meant that these young people couldn't hang out with each other um, and also getting warrants to arrest people for their lyrics on social media. Mm. So when you suggest like the um, school to prison kind of um, mm -hmm. pipeline. pipeline, it's not like just a pipeline, it's this porous like thing that's leaking uh, everywhere in terms of what you were just mentioning about immigration uh, policy, it's not just the school uh, to prison pipeline, but the to immigration detention offshore and for um, Pacifica peoples um, literally deported uh, back, but for South Sydney's, you know, that indefinite detention. So I know that wasn't a question, but just mm. um, finishing up, just seeing, you know, when you were saying, oh, this is violent or just like that idea of a covered face or a uh, cap, um, asking young people, like, why do you wear that? Mm. Some young people I've just been chatting to at a hip-hop event on the weekend were like, oh, I just didn't get my hair cut on the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
That's right. Uh, or they, because of the um, association laws, if they are, they have that disclaimer because they're mm. um, literally going to get arrested for being in that music video, or mm. they've they've got that justice uh, record. Mm. Um, so it's, that's not always apparent when you're watching mm. that um, to others. It looks visceral, it looks violent, but mm. there's a lot of violence going on structurally. Mm. I agree, and I think again that's part of the broader societal. It's it's a, it's a, a indicative of the issues within society, not just one particular area. Yeah. It flows across all areas. Thank you. I think there was one question at the top there. I'm conscious I know we're running out of time, sorry, but I know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we might uh, finish with this question. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate getting a, a chance to have a chat, I guess. I don't normally ask questions in these types of things, so. Um, I, I, I guess, like, I, and I already said before, like, I'm learning new stuff all the time, listening to, to people talk about um, performing and creative arts um, and so a lot of the like I I wanted to just say I don't get it um, how these conversations are still kind of happening like I thought like I said like Elvis to them like like NWA is kind of the same conversation yeah, yeah. same thing and then same like thing. The resistance police. through music has been over time and yep. I, I just thought like surely like how can it still be like now 30 40 years later again like like stressing out about, um, yeah, l lyrics in a song. I, I didn't get that part of it. Yeah. Um, yep. And then, like the big conversation is really like um, f resistance for disempowered groups is just always going to be there. So mm. then I get like in a way that music can be like an expression of that. But then really like, um, you know people will use the tools that they have. So whether that is um, crime to resist poverty or violence to resist yep. or um, music, but then I guess the seems to me to be um, the better path is to give tools to resist effectively. Yes. Um, and, you know, to, to be able to um, not comply, but yes. then also... Um, yeah, I, I, that's why I come back to, I didn't get like the thing yeah. about the song because yeah. it just seems like such a nothing. Yeah, yeah. So anyway. So, that's yeah, cool. thank you so much. Two quick responses to that. First one is what the reason why we're still having this conversation many years on is because it's all part of the colonial project. Neo-imperialism, neo-colonialism, again, critical whiteness, continues to permeate the way in which we set up Western societies. And until we shake that up, we're going to have this same conversation, I believe, in... 20 years from now, so, but I'm not, sorry. And the second quick thing, so it's, it's to do with societal norms and values. And if we're not, if we're not inclusive of other areas of, of diversity, then that will continue to perpetuate the dominant discourse in these spaces. And the second thing in regards to that idea of using music, one of the intriguing things about One Four is that they're being entrepreneurial by actually using music to actually mobilize their class and their positionality financially but now the police want to stop them. So what do they expect them to go back to? A life of marginality? It doesn't make sense. So it goes back to the same point, one of the same point around the dominant discourse being oppressive of any area of diversity because there's one way and one way only. And if we continue to create that particular dominant uh, area of society, then that can, that's going to continue to perpetuate these areas of marginality. Hopefully. I'm happy to talk to you further about this afterwards. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you so much, Kathy, um, for chairing, and Georgie, thank you again for a fabulous keynote that has just been a wonderful way to end what has been such a rich day that started with Artie Candice up there singing us into the space. We've had an amazing day and we couldn't have asked for a better way to finish it. So thank you so much for such a memorable keynote. We'll remember it for a long time, I'm sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes day two. We've still got one more, and we're certainly in for a treat with Teoti, who's going to be with us first up in the morning. So we hope you can have a nice break now, a nice relax, and we look forward to seeing you bright and early again. Thanks again to everyone for your incredible contributions. It's been such a fantastic, inspiring, illuminating, and I think really critically rigorous day as we've, we've asked the difficult questions and enjoyed thinking through them together. So we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks again.